Welcome to the Audio Spells production, Journeys of the Astropath, Michael. I am Cyril, and we are ecstatic to bring you this show. So please help us grow by following, liking, and sharing it. For more information and full credits, check out www.theastropath.com and search Journeys of the Astropath on Facebook. Now, let us cast your spell. If you've ever had an emotion of glee, of pure joy, turn to hard clay in your mouth, a clay that seeps down into your stomach and becomes a rock, then you know how I was feeling when Marlo said I could help but not save my sister. I mean, that's what this was all about from the beginning. Now I wasn't sure. Michael, he began. We were still in Bhutan by that amazing waterfall, by the way. I read the thoughts of the doctors helping your sister, and her coma is not something they expect her to recover from. But I can do something, I insisted. I have this power. I can go to her in her mind, in her coma, and I can guide her somehow to, to regain consciousness. I can, I can help. He looked at me very carefully before answering. Yes, you can guide her, and only you can. It's only you she would trust on this entire planet, and it's only you who can lead her to fight on or to let go and go in peace. My sister is a fighter, I insisted. Of course, that's why she's still alive now, and why you must go to her. I don't know if it was the things he was saying or the lack of strength I had, but those butterflies in my stomach I was feeling earlier were beginning to swarm in opposite directions, and I thought I was going to throw up. Oh, you're weak. Come on, we must return, he insisted. Now listen, concentrate on your body. Laying in that hospital bed, picture it. Your full body, and then get closer and closer as if you were sitting somewhere staring at the back of your hands in your lap and allow yourself to slip back into your body slowly. Don't rush it. But if you stall, force yourself to see through your eyes by opening them, opening them wide. I did as I was told. Picturing the room was like a doorway of sorts. I saw everything from memory saw myself lying there. Then, like focusing a zoom lens on a camera, I tried to bring myself tightly into focus. I really didn't know what I was doing, but neither does an infant searching for a nipple to nurse, and yet it finds it and it feeds. I saw my hands, really saw them, the lines, the hairs, the veins, and nails, and then I kind of felt a tug and bam! I was looking through my eyes again at the ceiling above my hospital bed, and my head hurt. Like I'd banged it against a shelf or something hard on my way down. Ouch, I mouthed. Suddenly Marla was beside me. Landings are a bit rough at first, he said, but you'll learn to take your time and to be a bit more gentle. It will become second nature to you the more you do it. I sat up. Now what? You don't have to go to sleep now to visit your sister. Her mind, he said. You can simply read her thoughts. I'll walk you down the hall to her. You can sit next to her, and there you can connect easily with her mind. We walked toward a room, and just before we arrived, he turned to me and said, This is not going to be easy to see, Michael. She's in bad shape but fight your sadness, control your weakness, find her and help her. He wasn't wrong. 
Seeing the web of tubes and monitors, wires draped on and around my sister's body was heartbreaking. Her bruised forehead and slashed face, stitched together and bandaged, was declarative proof of the horror that I had feared. In my dreams of our crash, I'd seen the wounds, seen them being made and just after, but fresh wounds in a memory lacked the hard, cold reality of post-traumatic swelling, colorization, and bandaging and binding. Her condition was real. Marlo helped me into the seat next to the bed. This is not astral projecting. Just look at her and open your mind to her, similar to when we use telepathy together. You don't leave your body, but still, you don't need to be disturbed. I'll be just outside the door, making sure you get the privacy you'll need, he assured me. He stepped out, and I was alone with her. I didn't even realize I'd been crying until I looked at my hands and saw the tears dripping into my lap from my soaked face. I rubbed my face with the palms of my hands, trying to breathe and fighting the tears and phlegm. I focused on her and entered the backyard of our youth. Things had changed. The yard was shadowy, as if a rainstorm was coming. The fort and the swing set, the random old toys were all gone, and only Cassandra, sitting on a brown tuft of grass, remained. She was looking away from me, off at the grayness of this odd sky. Cassandra? I said, but she didn't hear me. Cassandra, I nearly shouted, fearing perhaps she could no longer hear me. Mikey, she said, turning to me, and somehow her face flushed with a smile. I knew you'd come back. I knew you would. I'm here, I assured her, and did everything I could to appear calm, brave, strong for her. Where's the swing set and the fort, I ask? She stood up, scrunching up her face a bit with the confusion of that question. Yeah, the fort, yeah. Her voice trailed off. She pointed at the house behind me. Sometimes even the house goes away, but then it comes back, the swing set I hadn't thought about in a while. Yes, it was here. I love that swing, the creaking noise of it was like a song. The seat, the feeling of weightlessness when I swung. Suddenly the swing set reappeared. Without a word, she took a seat on the swing. Yeah, she said, that's it. Come on, Mikey, swing with me. I took my traditional seat in the swing next to her, not wanting to lose this moment, not wanting to rush anything. In every sense of the word, we were kids again, swinging side by side. When we were children, sometimes we had nothing to say because of the chaos in the house with our parents, and now we had no way to express the weight the universe was bearing down on us. It was all just too big to comprehend. Mikey, she began, you know I'll always be here for you. You look tired. This isn't about me, sis. I'm gonna help. I'm... But Marla was now next to me. I could feel his hand upon my shoulder. Something was wrong. Michael. Michael, a doctor is here, Marla whispered in my ear. I took a last glance at Cassandra and shook away the connection with her mind and tried to focus my eyes on the room where I was sitting, standing next to Marlowe, wearing a mask of anguish, was Dr. Smithson. 
I knew him from Cassandra's vivid description. Dr. Smithson, what do you want? I asked him. He looked at me as an afterthought. He had to have noticed me sitting there in my hospital gown, staring off into space. But perhaps his focus on my sister had blinded him to Marlowe and I. Michael, he finally said, glad you're feeling better, but I do think you should return to your room. You have some recovery of your own to do. I will check in on you uh, later. I was angry at him, obviously for no reason, and I wanted to choke him again for no reason. But his voice and calm and concern for Cassandra and even me froze my rage. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Marlo reading both our thoughts. What is he thinking? I thought to Marlo. Do you want the truth? He thought back to me. Out of habit, I nodded a yes to him. He's heartbroken. He's not the physician in charge, but they have spoken. There's not much that can be done. Michael, understand that she's on life support or she would die instantly. Terence Smithson had turned back to Cassandra, examining her, not as a doctor, but as a grieving lover. He touched her cheek, gently avoiding the tube that descended from her mouth. When he turned back to me, my entire life changed forever. <laughs>